Hi everybody, I'm Dr. Gray. I'm going to give you your introduction to Chem 2350, this first chapter, Biochemistry and Introduction. So what is biochemistry and metabolism other than the two fundamental things that we'll be going over this semester? Well, biochemistry is the study of the molecular basis of life. So what are the molecules that, you know, allow any living organism to actually live, thrive, and survive? Biochemists investigate living organisms using concepts from a variety of different fields, biology, chemistry, physics, and mathematics. Now, some of these things, well, biochemist is biology and chemistry, a biophysicist is very closely related to a biochemist, and a bioinformaticist is well, basically using all the data that biochemists generate and telling a story with that. Biochemists act as a bridge between biologists and chemists. So all the good things about chemistry and all the good things about biology in one. They strive to understand the chemistry of biological cell or living cell. Now these are a couple of examples of kind of the data sources that biochemists look at. In the upper left hand corner right here, what you see is what's known as an SDS page. We'll probably get into that a little bit later. Then this image right here and these images right here are different depictions of um, cells at different levels, so different micro microscopic views and using differential lighting sources to enhance different components of a living cell. Now, what is biochemistry and metabolism? Biochemistry is the study of the molecular basis of life, which we already talked about. We've already talked about what chemists, and, or sorry, biochemists do. Metabolism, on the other hand, is the sum of all the enzymatic reactions in a living organism. I'm sorry that my head is sort of blocking the word uh, enzyme-driven or enzymatic reactions in a living organism, but that's what metabolism is. In a nutshell, you could go ahead and say that, well, metabolism is the input the enzymes, and the output. Now this right here, as you can see, is kind of a circuit board. You have all these different components, all these different microchips that do different things, but they're all interconnected with one another. That's analogous to this right here. This is an extremely simplified view of human metabolism. So all the known metabolic pathways and how they're interconnected with one another. And if you zoom in a whole lot, well, you can see different components that we'll talk about, but this is just kind of your very grand overview. Well, this is important to know because you need to know the genetic impact of all of these different components, the environmental impact that all of these different components can send, and then the regulation that all of these different components, all of these different systems have on one another. So what's depicted here is kind of the, the well-known and accepted idea of central metabolism, but this doesn't show all of the secondary metabolism, all of the metabolism that all living organisms do. Instead, this is just for what humans do. And an idea of well, all of the different kind of major molecules that are processed by humans. So we're going to learn a lot. I'm sorry, there's a typo there. That's Y-O-U apostrophe R-E, because you are going to learn a lot this semester if you don't already know some of these. But what is life? Life is complex and dynamic. It's composed of organic carbon-based molecules. These have intricate 3D shapes, which you talked about in your 2150 class, or 2330 class. And all of these different molecules participate in chemical reactions. Life is organized and it's self-sustaining. Living organisms are organized hierarchically. For example, um, we can look at these molecules, we can look at, uh, sorry, this hierarchy as atoms, molecules, organelles, cells, tissue, organ, organ system, and an ultimate organism when we talk about a multicellular organism. So you can see that depicted right here at its lowest level. Of life, we've got an atom. Higher than that, we've got molecules, organelles, cells, specialized cells organized into tissue, and then tissue organizes into the liver, which is organized into a part of a organ system, which ultimately gives way to this tennis playing uh, woman. Okay. Uh, sorry about my backward uh, animations here, but atoms are, are carbon based building blocks for molecules. Molecules are, are 
biomolecules, macromolecules is what we're going to be focusing on in this class. Organelles has specialized functions of a cell. A cell is composed of organelles. Tissue is composed of cells. An organ is composed of tissues. An organ system is a group of related organs. And there we have our organ. So what is life? Life is cellular. All living things are composed of cells. Different structures and functions are involved in the division and formation of new cells. Life is information-based. Living organisms are information processing systems. Biological information stored as coded messages and genes. Transcription and translation are two very fundamental concepts that we'll be talking about quite a bit this semester. And life adapts and evolves based on the environmental cues as well as well, anything that it comes in contact with. So DNA, for instance, mutates. And so you can have those mutations that result in a differentially or a differently coded gene. Likewise, you have variation due to epigenetics. So different genes being turned on or turned off based on uh, perhaps an environmental stimuli or uh, well, something within the cell that signals turning on or turning off the gene's expression. Now, evolution ensures diversity and sustainability of different systems. Now, the simplest living organism is the cell. A prokaryotic cell or a prokaryotic cell is a cell that does not have a nucleus. This is the simplest extreme and extremely diverse into two major categories of archaea and bacteria. Now, a eukaryotic cell or a eukaryotic cell is a larger and more complex cell and falls into the life uh, domain of eukarya. Now, all of these different cells do chemistry of some sort. They require energy, energy. They require energy, and they conserve energy at all costs. All metabolic reactions are highly regulated and conserve energy at all costs. I'm sorry, and uh, sorry, all metabolic reactions are highly regulated to provide energy necessary for. Now, numerous different types of cells exist, and each of those are going to have different types of uh, metabolisms based on the basic concepts that are covered in this course. So a stem cell is kind of your, well, root cell that can be utilized to develop a different type of tissue or a different type of uh, cell. Now, as you see here, all these different types of tissue, muscle cells, liver cells, brain cells, neural tissue or uh, red blood cells or fat cells are going to metabolize different molecules in different ways. So your liver tissue, as you can see right here, is going to be able to process a number of different molecules compared to your red blood cells, which all that that's really going to do is it's going to take glucose and make lactate. Um, so different cells do different things. Living organisms are composed of thousands of inorganic and organic molecules. Now the composition of E. coli based on volume is, well, we're going to see that E. coli is largely accounted for in its uh, mass of water. Other components include proteins, RNA, DNA, and the volume occupied by uh, lipids is 3%. So we have all these different biomolecules uh, protein, RNA, DNA, and lipids that we're going to be looking at in this semester. Now cells are, as you can imagine, extremely complex. We like to see these depictions that you see above my head here and think, ah, that's perfect. That's all that there is. I see my, my major membrane-bound organelles and I see this movement of these different vesicles and ah, there we go. I got it. But that's super oversimplified because what that is is just a cross-section of what you're supposed to care about in that image. But keep this in mind that all these different things are taking place simultaneously. So you have a very complicated system. Now, as an example to illustrate that, in addition to the vast majority of the volume of a cell being occupied by water, you have thousands and thousands of different types of proteins and copies of those proteins. So if you wanted to imagine you have 26,000 unique proteins within a cell, well, you have thousands of copies of those and then thousands of copies of those in different kind of uh, 
structural shapes at any given point in time. Now, our major classes of biomolecules, first and foremost, is our nucleotides. These are the building blocks of, uh, or sorry, these are our building blocks, our DNA and RNA. Now, each contain three different components. And that one word there, nucleotide, illustrates that. A nucleotide consists of three things. One, a five carbon sugar. That sugar is either ribose or deoxyribose. The next is an nitrogenous base. Now, those are heterocyclic aromatic rings. So, those two, or sorry, our nitrogenous bases fall into two different categories. They are either purines or pyrimidines. Now, the last thing that makes it a nucleotide is the presence of one or more phosphate group. Now, what we will commonly see is we'll see, commonly see them having three phosphate groups. Um, ATP, for example, I'm sure that y'all are you're you're all very familiar with ATP. Well, that has a total of three phosphate groups on it. Now, our N-glycosidic bond is what attaches our nitrogenous base to that sugar. The phosphoester bond is what attaches our first phosphate group to a sugar. Now, here are the examples of our purines and pyrimidines. Now, what I'd like you to see and what I want to really draw your attention to is I'm going to circle the nitrogen where we have our linkage between our nitrogenous base and the sugar of our, our ribose or deoxyribose. So we have our are two different classes of molecules. They are purines and pyrimidines. If you see something, a nitrogenous base with one, two rings, that is an example of a purine. If there is only one ring, that's a pyrimidine. Our pyrimidines are uracil, thymine, <coughs> and cytosine. Our purines are two, or our bicyclic structures are adenine and guanine. Okay, now the numberings of these, well, I don't need you to know those numberings, but I will need you to know those numberings on the sugars that correspond. So as you can see here though, purines, two rings, pyrimidines, one ring. Now here's an example of a, well, a nucleic acid and specifically a nucleotide. This would be a <clears throat> one, two, three phosphate molecule. We have, on our connection between our nitrogenous base and our sugar carbon number one, two, three, four, five. Now, one thing that's really important that you recognize is that the numbering of our carbons on our sugar is different from the numbering on of the atoms on our nitrogenous base. This is designated one prime, two prime, three prime, four prime. And five prime. So that prime is what separates our, our, our that distinguishes our atom numbering in our sugar from the atom numbering in our nitrogen space. Next class of my biomolecules, amino acids. These are the building blocks for a protein. Now, the basic structure contains an amino group and a carboxyl group with a variable side chain. There are a total of 20 proteinogenic or 20 extremely common proteinogenic amino acids. That word proteinogenic, well, think about it as the prefix or the first word protein, ogenic meaning of making. So these are the amino acids that are involved in the synthesis of proteins. Uh, or the building blocks of proteins. There are amino acids that are not integrated in proteins, in which case they are not proteinogenic amino acids. So the properties of these different amino acids are all dictated by the different R groups. And we'll get into those later on. We're going to specifically talk about our amino acids, but for the time being, I want you to understand our amino acids are, well, first of all, there's 20 proteinogenic amino acids. They have an NH3 and a COOH. Now, our alpha carbon is the carbon that connects our NH3. So I always think about a backbone looking something like this. 
Now, I didn't draw all of my atoms here, but this would be my alpha carbon. Here's my amino, and here's my carboxy, uh, carboxyl termini. Um, they are going to be chiral in every single um, atom, or sorry, in every single amino acid except for glycine. Now, peptide bonds and peptides, you will need to know all 20 amino acids, the names, the three-letter codes, and properties of each. I will give you the structures on your exams. You will, however, need to be able to identify, if I give you the structure of the molecule, I'll need you to recognize that is arginine, that is lysine. I'll give you the pictures, but the pictures will not be labeled. Okay. Now. These amino acids, as I kind of alluded to a moment ago, they have functions other than in building proteins. So here's an example of a serine and an alanine. And what they are doing is they're coming together to make a peptide bond. So the C termini of one and the R and the N termini of another come together to make a peptide bond. Now this is a molecule that's fairly complex, but it's kind of a short building block for a protein. Now, major classes of biomolecules. Our third one is our sugars. Um, these sugars are also known as carbohydrates. They have a very, fairly simple structure. Um, the pentoses and, keto and hexoses are the most common sugars, so five carbons or six carbons. And they're going to be classified based on the functional group that's present. Either it's going to be an aldehyde, in which case that sugar is an aldose, or it's going to be a ketone, in which case that sugar is a ketose. Now, the basic, the most simplest uh, carbohydrate is known as a monosaccharide. Um, your two most common are glucose and fructose, and we'll look at those structures later on, but that's kind of your, your simple thing. Um, glucose is commonly found as a monomer in lots of different molecules, for instance, glycogen, as well as um, uh, cellulose. Um, but these monosaccharides can be used as building blocks for larger molecules, oligosaccharides or polysaccharides. Um, these chains are connected through what are known as glycosidic linkages or glycosidic bonds. Again, we'll get into that later on when we talk about chapter or when we talk about carbohydrate. So here's an example of D-glucose in its linear straight chain form. Here is D-glucose as a cyclic sugar. And then here's the two different variations which that sugar can take on. It can be an alpha or a beta sugar, alpha sugar. Likewise, we'll get into this later on. Now, your major, your fourth major class of biomolecules are your fatty acids. So your fatty acids fall into two different categories. They are saturated or unsaturated. And all that that relates to is the presence of double bonds. Now, fatty acids have two different major components. They're going to have a carboxy termini, so an ionizable, an ionizable group, and then they're also going to have an aliphatic chain. So just a bunch of carbons and hydrogens. Now what I've drawn right here is not exactly the best drawing of all time, but this shows my aliphatic end and my carboxylic end. Now the sugar that, or sorry, the fatty acid that I've drawn here, well, I don't have any double bonds. That would be a saturated fatty acid. Now when I do this, I have two double bonds, that is an unsaturated fatty acid. Again, we'll get into these later on. So essentially, this is what you need to take away at this point in time. We're going to dive deep into all of these later on, but your monomeric unit for your major biomolecules are amino acids, sugars, fatty acids, and nucleotides. Uh, three of these can be used to form polymers. Amino acids form proteins, sugars form carbohydrates or uh, polysaccharides, nucleotides form DNA and RNA molecules. All of these different things play different roles. So proteins can be used to catalyze specific reactions. They can serve a structural role within a cell. Carbohydrates can be great energy sources and can provide structural support. 
DNA and RNA? Well, genetic information and transmission of genetic information, and they can be involved in protein synthesis. Now, fatty acids, despite not forming polymers, they're still great energy stores, and they can provide lipid structures and, of cells. Okay. Now, the functional groups that are most important for you to know about this are going to be shown here. So the major functional groups are alcohol, alcohols, aldehydes, ketones, carboxylic acids, amines, amides, thiols, esters, and alkenes. A look at those. Here's your alcohol, ROH, and aldehyde, RCOH. A ketone, RC, double bond, O, R prime. An acid, a carboxylic acid, an amine, an amide, a thiol, an ester, and an alkene. Now, I'm going to talk about each one of these whenever we actually look at them, but just if you wanted to kind of jog your memory on these things, well, here they all are. Now, as you can see here, this is an example of a molecule where they have multiple of these double or multiple of these different functional groups. So if we look at structure A right here, well, we've got a carbon with a double bonded oxygen and an OH. That would be a great example of a carboxylic acid. Now, if we look at structure B right here, we've got a carbon, and then we've got an oxygen and another carbon. That would be a great example of an ester. Next up, C, we've got an, am an amide right here. Then in D, we've got an amine. E, we've got an alkene, and simply that double bond right there. Like I said, we're going to get into all these different functional groups whenever it's relevant, but these are your five most important ones to take away from this. Now, six major biochemical reactions we'll discuss in this class. One, nucleophilic substitution reactions. These are usually going to be SN2 reactions. We're going to have a nucleophile, and we're going to have a leaving group. As we can illustrate here, here's our nucleophile, and what it's going to do is it's going to see this partial positive, and it's going to force something to just go ahead, and this X is going to say, see ya, I'm gone. We're going to do elimination reactions, enzyme-driven elimination reactions, where all well, this hydroxide and this hydrogen, they're going to dip on out, and now we've got H2O that's going to, take, uh, that's going to uh, be gone. And this is all an example of a dehydration reaction. We'll see the addition reactions where we have an alkene plus another molecule. And we're going to form this alkane with well, some variations to it. Uh, isomerization reactions where we'll take something like citrate to make isocitrate. Where we've just rearranged some things. Some things. Oxidation reduction reactions which we'll probably see more than anything else and hydrolysis reactions, where we're breaking an example of a, a, a glycosidic linkage. So energy is what we're going to be pretty concerned with this in, in this class, especially whenever we're getting to our metabolism. Energy is defined as the capacity to do work. Cells release most of our energy as a result of redox reactions and movement of electrons. Energy is trapped and used to make ATP. ATP, well, it's going to be synthesized in the mitochondria quite often, the powerhouse of the cell, and this is going to be the currency of the cell. Organisms are categorized by the strategy for acquiring organism, uh, sorry, of energy. They are either autotrophs or heterotrophs. If they're autotrophs, they're getting energy for themselves, whereas if they're heterotrophs, they're going to rely on other organisms for energy. Uh, examples of Autotrophs, you've got photoautotrophs and chemoautotrophs. A photoautotroph would be a photosynthetic organism, whether that's a plant or a bacterium. And chemoautotrophs, uh, they are going to take care of and oxidize uh, inorganic chemicals. Heterotrophs, you've got chemoheterotrophs. They are going to use preformed food molecules. And uh, photoheterotrophs, they're going to use uh, light and food uh, for their energy sources. Now, metabolic pathways are going to fall into two different categories. They're either going to be anabolic 
or they're going to be catabolic. An anabolic pathway synthesizes and builds stuff up. I always think of anabolic steroids. You're building up your muscles, whereas catabolic processes are going to break things down. And you're going to take something from something that is large to something that's small. And anabolic is going to take something small to make it large. Now, biological order. Well, processes can be synth uh, classified. Synthesis and degradation of biomolecules. Transport of ions and molecules across membrane is going to be uh, active or passive. And cellular movement. Cytoskeleton moves internal organelles. Cell division, DNA replication, hormone secretion, and waste removal. So we are going to be talking about all these things much later on when we're talking about our metabolic processes. What this basically has been is a, uh, a preview of everything that you probably already know, but now we're going to be putting it in into context within this class. So there's a lot of material, but the good thing is you already know quite a bit of it. All right, well, I'll see you in the next chapter.